So this is preventing a hostile matrix, a game in virtual reality security called ARMS. Uh, I'm Pierre Clemenko, uh, handle Alley Ghost. So I want to open with a quote. What I thought was 50 years away was only 10 years away. And what I thought was 10 years away, it was already here. I just wasn't aware of it yet. Bruce Sterling. There's a reason I bring this quote up. Ultimately, in 2012, I was working with a group called Real Extend. And in IRC, we were talking about the future of virtual reality. Everyone was thinking virtual reality was 15 years away. In 2013, the Oculus Rift debuted on Kickstarter. That was the beginning of commercial virtual reality this cycle. What we thought was 15 years away was one year away. So let's get started. A little bit of a parental advisory at first. Some content may not be appropriate for children or people who cannot realize that we are currently in and walking further into a cyberpunk dystopia. So who am I? I'm a security consultant with Foresight. A VR developer and entrepreneur, a former collaborator on Real Extend, currently diving into Unity 3D. I'm currently working on the side on VR applications to make tools for use in intelligence and, and cybersecurity. And I'm a VR cyber pathogen. And of course, I'm also a cyberpunk because fuck you, that's why. So, alphabet soup. Let's get started with some acronyms and definitions because otherwise everyone's going to be lost. VR is virtual reality. It's full immersion, sensory deprivation. Think the Oculus Rift or the HTC Vive. AR, augmented reality. It's basically the HoloLens. It's essentially overlaying a digital HUD onto the real world using basically goggles or glasses. <laughs> Presence. A sensation tied to VR which causes your high level brain to realize you're still in VR, but your low level brain thinks you're actually there. So because we all have basically primitive monkey brains, for lack of a better term. Our brain starts to think, wait, I'm actually in this world, and because of that, after about 10, 15 minutes, you forget you're in virtual reality. Ultimately, this can cause some very interesting phenomenons and has been known to allow people to forget they're in virtual reality and do stupid stuff like trying to lean on a virtual object or have deeper emotional connection. It's also why it's useful in medical technologies at times. And FPS, frames per second. Or how many frames are rendered on the screen within a second. 90 is the minimum required for virtual reality. Otherwise, you're going to get sick. Blame your inner ear. Uh, your inner ear, if you have that distortion between what you see in the sensory deprivation combined with what's expected physiologically, you're going to get sick, nauseous, and might throw up. Not a good thing. And MMI, Man Machine Interface. You'll understand why I'm bringing this up in a little bit. So, this is not a technical talk. This is a call to action about VR and AR and game security. I'm not here to sell you on VR. It's something you have to experience for yourself. And you have to use a real headset, not one of those junk gear VRs or Google Cardboards or whatever they push at, you know, insert cell phone store here. You need to use something like an actual HTC Vive or an actual Oculus Rift to truly experience it. And this is a warning that the present, let alone the future, is going to be a cyberpunk dystopia. And we need to step in now. So why are we here? Virtual reality and augmented reality is the next generation of user interfaces. And ultimately, this is going to be when all those problems we overlooked with game security because it's just a game come back to bite us in the ass. This is where everything starts to fold into game security becoming industrial applications and medical technologies. That's right, this is used in medicine, and I'll explain it to you. And the hardware and software is coming closer to wetware. What this means is within a decade or two, virtual reality and augmented reality technologies will serve as the basis for cybernetic interfaces. That's right, if technology goes the way it has gone, the code will be reused in cybernetic eyes and things like that. And congratulations, that's possible root access on your actual monkey brain. So, yeah. So another quote. The future is unwritten. There are best case scenarios, worst case scenarios. Both of them are fun to write about if you're a science fiction novelist. 
but neither of them ever happens in the real world. What happens in the real world is always a sideways case scenario. World changing marvels to us are just wallpaper to our children. I had a dream. You see, years ago I had a dream that as humanity became connected and more technologically advanced, we developed new tools, not just virtual reality and augmented reality, but cybernetics and even other tools like that. Eventually, the virtual reality and augmented reality technologies we develop now will start to interface directly with our own brains. Unfortunately, this became a nightmare. Because this was unsecure and poorly designed, people were able to be influenced, spied on, or even controlled by malicious attackers. This caused terrorism, crime, and worse. Ultimately, what we really don't want is our insecure technologies now leading to someone being able to crypto locker your brain 20 years from now. That's ultimately the biggest threat we have in this specific area. If you know, your, if you know the enemy and yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. Cliche, but appropriate. The current AR and VR hardware set looks pretty much like this. You've got your Oculus and your Vive, which are your two mainstream high-end headsets. You've got your phones, Gear VR, Daydream. That's all your mobile VR that you would see in a cell phone store or, you know, also cardboard. But you've got the Fove, which is a experimental foveated rendering headset. It's currently not available, and I think I need to explain this. Foveated rendering uses eye tracking to detect where your pupil is focused, so that way it can select where it's going to focus rendering power and thereby reduce detail in other areas so that way only the areas that aren't affect that are actually in your vision and not in your periphery are highly detailed. This improves quality and frames per second compared to current methods. This is currently experimental but it's, it's, it's speculated it's going to be in the second generation of consumer headsets so it's coming soon. I should also note something very important here. Eye tracking is used for things like marketing purposes and analytics. There is a group of people, including some people that worked on the original polygraph, that's working on using eye tracking to do lie detection. Anyone who's familiar with the polygraph knows it only has a 50% effective ratio. They're claiming with eye tracking it's up to 80%. So have fun with that thought. You also got the Meta and the Meta 2 and the HoloLens, which the Meta and the Meta 2 is a tethered, meaning HDMI, augmented reality headset, and that plugs directly into your laptop or computer. And then you've got the HoloLens, which is an Intel Atom-based, basically mini computer on your head with two gigs of RAM. The problem with the HoloLens is, unfortunately, it's very restrictive and underpowered. And unfortunately, Microsoft does not like you creating custom gestures. And as a developer, that aggravates me. That aggravates me a lot because that restricts what I can develop and what I can experiment with. And then you've got the BT200 and 300 by Epson, which are Android-based augmented reality goggles as well. The BT300 was like just released like within the last month. Um, then you've got Google Cardboard, which is, well, a cardboard box which you stick your phone in and has some lenses. And then you've got other devices as well, you know, just to lay a land. For input, on the other hand, you've got Oculus Touch and the Vive Wands. The Oculus Touch I do not have much detail on because those are not publicly available yet. Those will be publicly available in December, and I hope to have more information as the technology grows and as I can get a hold of it. The Vive Wands come with the HTC Vive. The Vive Wands, I'll explain a little more later. Uh, you've got clickers and remotes, stuff like Daydream and gear, uh, the new Gear VR. Those are based off clickers and remotes. Not exactly very advanced, but it gets the job done. You've also got gesture and motion tracking. There are tools like the Leap Motion, which hopefully at least some people in the room have heard of. You've also got the Manus VR, which is essentially a glove that goes on your uh, a glove that goes on your arm and your hand, and it uses sensors to actually detect how your hand is moving, and it uses the lighthouse sensor from the Vive's wand to track the movement of the hand itself, or rather the arm itself, and it can do full inverse schematics and all that stuff. Uh, the problem with the Leap Motion is that because it's an infrared camera-based system and has a limited field of view. If there's anything including tracking, it sends it all off. The Manus VR does not apparently have that problem. You've also got eye tracking, um, like I said, foveated rendering. Have fun with the idea of using that for authentication. 
or for marketing data or things like that. Hello, 1984. And you've got wearables, Android Wear, iWatch, uh, Fitbit. All these things have been, on some level, integrated to Unity 3D, which is the most common virtual reality engine. You can pull data from those devices into Unity 3D to do things like health tracking and more. You've also got EEG and other solutions. There are actually devices out there, specifically the ones I can think of off the top of my head, are the Emotive and the Muse, which actually read your brain waves that you put on your head and read your brain waves so you can actually control the brain or you can control the computer with your brain. There's also versions which can be used for EEG research and stuff like that. So, you know, if you were to pop a box and someone was wearing one of those, you could literally read the person's mind. Have fun with that thought. And you've got others as well. And this is only the beginning because there's a lot more coming down the line and there's also stuff from ranging from treadmills to basically bicycles that are designed for VR. And it's going even further than that. This is only the beginning. So, a couple points of interest on the Oculus itself. Tracking is done with infrared and cameras, constellation system. It uses infrared detectors in one camera by default, but with a the touch they're including a second camera. And they're suggesting buying a third camera for room scale tracking. Um, I should note that room scale tracking is essentially you set up multiple cameras in a room and as you walk around the room it tracks you and your movements and the movements of the devices in question so you can actually physically walk around and inter interact with things in the virtual world. Um, you've got HDMI and USB for main connections to the system. Uh, I'm still weighing on data on their Guardian system which is their movement boundaries and the Oculus Touch, which is their motion control systems because they haven't been released yet. I should also note one more thing. The Oculus Rift, last I checked, uses one HDMI and two USB cables, I think USB 3 cables, for main connections to the system. I'll explain why I'm saying this in a minute. And I should also note that Facebook's privacy policy on the Oculus allows them to slurp all your computer's data. By putting the Oculus drivers and software on your system, According to their privacy policy, you're basically giving them access to everything on your computer. And this is Facebook we're talking about, so we all know how that's going to end. Hi, Zuck. Have total rootkit access on my system. I don't give a crap. So a couple points of interest on the Vive for hardware. Tracking is done with lasers from base stations, the Lighthouse system. The Vive comes with two Lighthouse trackers which are designed to be put on two opposite corners of the room, but you can also do them right in front of you or whatever. The maximum tracking is supposed to be 5 by 5 meters, so that's about 15 by 15 feet. Uh, front camera for pass-through and chaperone system. The chaperone system, let's say you're walking up to this table right here, it'll actually put a little uh, wireframe of the table or any objects in front of you, so you don't, say, walk into a wall, because head injuries suck. Uh, You've got HDMI and USB for main connections to the system. It goes from a headset to a breakout box to the main system, and you plug the headset's cables into the breakout box, and then the breakout box has other cables which go into the back of the system. Now, I should note, in the actual headset itself, you've got a little panel on the top of it which you can pull out. You have one power cable, you have one HDMI cable and you have one USB cable by default, but you also have a second USB port that you can plug whatever you want into. So you know if you, say, have a rubber ducky or something like that, have appropriate form factor. Eh, just saying, nice little attack vector. And you've got a link box between the headset and the computer. It also acts as a Bluetooth receiver. So this is important because Bluetooth is used for various components including headset sync with phone and tech, phone for calls and text in VR. So you are literally using the HTC Vive Android app to take calls and do texting in your VR headset. So you are linking your phone to your VR headset, which adds another attack vector there. But on top of that, Bluetooth is also used for control between the controllers and the base stations. And this is all using Bluetooth 4 or LE and while I think it's encrypted, I have to double check because it looked encrypted, but I was not completely sure if I just didn't manage to properly decode it. 
but it looks like it's encrypted, thank God. Um, just imagine the kind of man in the middle you could do with that. So common virtual reality and augmented reality engines. You got Unity 3D, which is your most common one. Unfortunately, because it's heavily based on third-party assets, and unfortunately a lot of game developers don't properly learn how to code and just, hey, say, here's a tutorial. Let's go jump in and sell a couple things for, say, $60 on the asset store and not bother to namespace our code. Or, you know, not doing integer checking, which is rampant. Heck, there's a Valve, I think it was... Okay, so Valve on their Steam VR asset, as in Steam Valve, they have not namespaced their code. It gets worse in that I have detected multiple instances where Unity will pop up a little warning saying, hey, there's a no pointer reference. And people ship their plugins and code without making sure they fix the no pointer references and they charge for this shit. Um, Source code requires extra money, so you can't really audit it if you're an amateur. They want full enterprise access. Uh, the most common virtual reality and augmented reality engine. It's C Sharp and Mono based, but it's using an old version of Mono, so yeah, they're in the process of upgrading it, but for now it's limited to .NET 3.5 feature set. So yeah, a bit outdated. It's also using JavaScript and Boo. Boo is a bastard version of Python, which they decide, hey, I know. Let's say you know, Python isn't exactly what we want, so let's just create a new implementation that's similar to Python, has similar syntax, but isn't actually Python. Great, great job creating your own programming language, guys. We really needed that. And you can also plug in additional language support as well. There's plugins for things like Lua, for example. Uh, Unreal Engine assets tend to be more expensive, but I do not have data on those assets yet because money. And source is given when you sign up on GitHub, but not actually open source. So luckily, you just have to sign up for the engine for free, and then link your GitHub account, and they'll give you access to their GitHub repositories. And they give you access to Unreal Engine and Unreal Tournament source code, which is always nice, because you can actually audit it, and there have been audits done. But it's not actually open source. You can't redistribute it outside that EULA. Um, it's the second most common virtual reality and augmented reality engine. Uh, doesn't quite have the support that Unity does, though. It's C++ based. Unfortunately, there's a lot of legacy code in there. Up until last year, there was, let's see, what was it? Up until like late, le, uh, up until last year or early this year, there was AES code in there, which they thought they could actually modify. They thought it was a good idea to try and modify the cipher. So that way, they could try and make it so if the stream was interrupted, it wouldn't break things. We're talking about a stream site for people. Congratulations. So Blueprints Visual Scripting is a baked-in option. Essentially, it's node-based scripting, which you just connect the nodes and expose classes in C++ to that, so you can use those. But there's also a third-party JavaScript plugin for it from NCSoft. Um, the state of game and virtual reality development today. Uh, game assets and tutorials, especially tied to Unity 3D, are horrible from a security standpoint and horrible from a code quality standpoint. A lot of these don't bother to do integer checking or, for that matter, namespace their code. And that is why I want to scream sometimes because, unfortunately, when you're working with Unity 3D, you're going to have a lot of assets where you're going to have to just overhaul things for things you paid a good amount of money for just because people can't be bothered to fix their stuff because they didn't know any better. Uh, game development or game developers usually don't have any security mindset at all or they think it's or they think security is DRM and anti-cheat rather than anti-shell. Luckily MMOs seem to be the exception, but that is the exception and not the rule. Luckily um, this seems to be changing. I recently saw news that Bohemian Interactive who made the Arma series has recently added security exploits and vulnerabilities to their bug tracker for private reporting. Luckily, these guys seem to be taking it seriously, but I suspect that might be tied to the fact that they had O'Day dropped at DEF CON on their game. Um, a lot of engines don't encrypt their netcode in chat. Luckily, this seems to be changing, and people are using OpenSSL more for encrypted netcode, but people still don't bother to encrypt their chat. And unfortunately, the primary 
chat protocol I can think of that would be useful, which will go unnamed, is GPL implementation based and doesn't have properly documented information on it. So the only way to make any sort of implementation is to derive from GPL code. And unfortunately, the developer who will go unnamed thought it would be a good idea to try to charge an open source project that tried to re-implement that protocol in another programming language, two and a half million dollars for licensing because they didn't want to use the GPL. There's now a court case over this, apparently. Really, this isn't helping anyone. So, technical considerations and game development mentality. Virtual reality requires 90 frames per second, otherwise you're going to get physically sick. Um, this is a physiological response from the inner ear. This is not a technical limitation. Um, this is a wetware limitation. Most game developers have no security background and most CS programs do not bother to teach secure programming or security mindset. This extends to game development programs and other programs, as well as school and tutor schools and tutorials. Uh, bad habits form early and are hard to break, so this is ultimately an application security problem. This really ultimately comes down to application security. And a lot of bad third party code comes into play as well. Uh, virtual reality developer mentality in particular needs to be having some specific notes on. Virtual, re er, virtual, re uh, virtual reality requires us to throw the entire user interface and user experience book out the window. The objective now is to focus on how the interfe interface feels first and build it from there. So we do a lot of rapid prototyping. User tests are common and are trying to make the interface feel more natural, not artificial. The idea of, oh, well, I'm going to hit a button or I'm going to check a checkbox or whatever. If it's natural feeling, maybe. But if it's like, oh, I'm going to hold a tab and do yada, 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 hitting buttons or moving sliders, that's not what people are trying to do because ultimately the objective is to make things feel more natural and make it feel more visceral. Uh, programmers are also user experience designers and the gap is closing every day. Luckily, this is a good thing. Uh, virtual reality and augmented reality are still very, uh, still very experimental though, and there are very few best practices in place. And most of them are along the lines of stay seated and develop for seated environments, or make sure the user doesn't get sick. There's nothing really there about code quality or anything like that, just like basic, you know, how to make people not get sick and how to do user experience over code quality. Uh, rapid prototyping is key in a lot of designs and code get thrown out because it fails usability testing. Uh, Google suggested turnaround time for prototyping is two days. So you're actually developing these tests for user experience and user interface design in two days and determining whether you're going to keep it or throw it out. Not much time for code quality there. And code quality, as I have been saying, is often the last thing on a developer's mind. Unfortunately, because of the speed of development, most people don't really have time for that. So another interesting quote. The most interesting thing about virtual reality that you can't find out anywhere is the feeling of act, or the actual feeling of presence. And the feeling of being in virtual reality, it's not something that can be communicated by talking about it. You very quickly accept the fact that you're in a different place. The feeling is something incredibly novel. It's a visceral experience to be able to trick yourself into believing you're somewhere else. That's a quote by Aaron Koblin, who is a virtual reality developer, and he's right. Ultimately, as much as I could stand up here blowing the air saying, oh, well, we need to develop for this hour and next thing, and it's a totally different thing, until you say, go to Christiana Mall and go to the GameStop there and try the Vive, which <coughs> I suggest everyone do, <coughs> you're not going to understand what I'm talking about because ultimately it is a completely different experience to what we've experienced up until now. Um, so, very specific note on presence, but first I want everyone to watch this GIF because it's perfect. <laughs> so, what we just saw here is the kid was so immersed in virtual reality that he forgot that the object in front of him was not physical, leaned over, and oh. <laughs> so, there's a reason for this GIF. Um, as much as I talk about presence and stuff, the reality is because you have that process of not realizing you're in virtual reality at one point, there's a possibility where, say, 
if the chaperone system did not detect, say, the stairs in front of you, you might take a fall. Um, just saying, if you don't see your cat, that could end badly. Um, yeah. So ultimately, we're on new horizons. And virtual reality and augmented reality require new design methodologies. And old design methodologies are obsolete. And, must, and there must be a more organic and natural feeling in how they work. Everything is still experimental, and no one really knows what works best yet. And there's a lot of research and development going on to figure out what works best from everywhere, from Google to Facebook to startups. Ultimately, everyone is working on this in the big fields. And a lot of people, including Mark Zuckerberg himself, have been pushing this pretty heavily. So ultimately, we need to jump on this now before it gets real bad. Uh, virtual reality and augmented reality are web 1.0 stage. But that's a good thing, because it gives us a chance to step in before things go horribly wrong. Ultimately, it's better to bake security in from the early days than to have to bolt it on later. Um, so there's one very specific reason I'm bringing this up. This is the Gartner hype curve, which shows from left to right the process of building hype, then coming down to Earth, and then actually building practicality to the plateau of productivity over here. So ultimately, uh, human augmentation is right here. Augmented reality is right here. And virtual reality is right here. So augmented reality is just finishing bottoming out. And then virtual reality is just starting to come up to being practical. Virtual reality and augmented reality are five to 10 years out from being at the plateau. And human augmentation is more than 10 years out. There's a very specific reason to bring up human augmentation. Though. Also, I should note that machine learning is two to five years from plateau and just approaching peak hype. So uh, expect a crash on that soon. Because this has been a very accurate model. Uh, this is basically based on mobile and all that stuff. And we are ultimately coming into a new mobile phase. Um, so another thing I need to point out, ultimately, this is going to be very big financially and business-wise as well. Augmented reality by 2020 is going to be a $90 billion business, according to Digi Capital. And according to Digi Capital, virtual reality will be $30 billion. These are going to be extremely big, and these are going to be extremely vulnerable unless we act now. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because we're looking at the next mobile. And ultimately, if we don't fix this now, we're going to be hurting later, just like how we're hurting now because Android was a mess security-wise at the beginning, and no one was bothering. So another quote, does virtual reality provide us with new ways to augment and enhance and experience reality, or does it undermine and threaten that reality? Virtual reality is equally prone to portrayal as, as either the bearer of bright utopian possibilities or dark dystopian nightmares, and both these views have some basis to recommend them. And that's from Derek Stenvosky, or however you pronounce his name. Sorry. <laughs> so there are problems on the horizon, unfortunately. We're going to have shells, some of them with ghosts in them, uh, privacy, and other nasties. So we're going to obviously have O-Day all over the place. Unfortunately, as much as we want to push software development life cycle changes, people don't care. They really don't. Not until they get bit. Then you've got privacy, and I'll bring that up in a moment. But you've also got other nasties. Think about malware, for example. Think about IoT botnets, crypto lockers, things like that, because that's going to be hitting this as well. So this is where privacy comes in. I'm sure everyone knows about Pokemon Go and how, hey, let's request access to everything on the phone and everything on the Google account to play Pokemon. What? <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's not malicious. Sometimes it's just complete and total fail or QA fail, which this apparently was. But yeah, what? Uh, ultimately, what it comes down to is this is ultimately going to be used for spying, intelligence, and everything else. I should note explicitly. That Sony is working on contact. Sony has patented contact lenses, which act as both a camera and an augmented reality display device. 
contact lenses and you thought Google Glass was bad. Um, this is going to be a mess privacy wise and we need to act soon. We're going to have to establish some practice to fix this. Um, current uses of virtual and augmented reality include entertainment, everything from movies to games to you know music videos. Uh, commerce. Uh, there's shopping apps. There's people using it in, uh, let's see, uh, real estate and all those markets. And you've got industrial applications such as CAD. And you've got vehicle interfaces. I think it was Mercedes was working on an augmented reality headset for use in their cars. Um, medical devices. And not just medical devices. It's being used to train surgery and perform surgery. And it's also being used for treatment of things like PTSD and phantom limb syndrome. So phantom limb syndrome, in case anyone doesn't know, if, you arm, if your arm gets blown off, you have this really nasty sensation because your brain still thinks the arm is there, but it's not actually there, so it's really painful. Virtual reality is being used to help treat this, among other things. And it's also being used by military intelligence, law enforcement, and emergency services. Apparently, law enforcement agencies are even using virtual reality to practice for hostage rescue situations a lot faster than they were because previously they had to build up kill houses to actually practice clearing rooms. Now they can just scan the room and put in VR and they're done. Practice that way. Uh, it's also being used for court cases. And there was recently a news story about how they're using virtual reality to hunt down the last Nazi war criminals by recreating Auschwitz to try and determine who was actually telling the truth about what they could actually see. So they've actually gone after at least one Nazi war criminal that's still alive, well, was still alive. He died right before being extradited. But they've been going after the last remaining Nazi war criminals to chase them down with this technology. Uh, it's not exactly uncommon. At this point, it's going to be getting more common. But what's the worst that could happen? I mean, really, what could possibly go wrong here? I mean, this is actually based off a mock-up of an actual device that's being developed by a defense contractor, I should mention. This is actually something that they're working on. This could not possibly go wrong. I mean, oh no, I'm just going to say that the UAV Reaper video was here, and I'm going to say there's an enemy right here, even though there's not, project that enemy right there, and I'm going to make it look like he's about to fire, and then all of a sudden you have other guys thinking, oh my god, I'm being attacked, I'm being attacked. And then you wind up having people reveal their positions or shooting themselves. It could end badly. But luckily, it's not all bad. Uh, here is actually a picture of virtual reality being used to treat PTSD in veterans. Ultimately, this is being used to treat medical problems. It's also being used to treat people in therapy and things like that. There's a lot of research going on right now as far as psychology and therapy and how virtual reality can be used to treat those. Furthermore, augmented reality could be used for things like teaching people social skills. Um, you've got this, which is an actual product. Uh, I will redact the name. But it actually displays windows and can actually display windows windows, as in like Excel, in virtual reality in a virtual reality desktop. So you can actually move your windows like this and this and this and just look around all over the place. And while unfortunately the technology right now is kind of limited because the screens are ultimately 1080p in each eye, so text is really blocky. It's projected within five years. Actually, it was projected like two days ago by Michael Brash over at Oculus. Then in five years, it's going to be at 4K in each eye. And then soon after that, it'll probably be at 8K. And then you've got tools like Google Tilt Brush, which is ultimately used for creative stuff, such as painting in 3D space, and can ultimately possibly be used for other purposes such as making movies, music videos, whatever. Um, uh, ultimately, there are other potentials that actually allow this to be completely awesome. This is a leap motion demo right here. And they're actually able to detect hand movement. And I'm pretty sure that's a Vive wand, where they can actually manipulate a map and do things to look at places. This is only the beginning. And on top of that, this is a Meta 2 demo from the Meta 2 augmented reality headset, 
where they are able to project 3D interfaces in the real world. So ultimately, while it sounds bad, there are a lot of very interesting use cases we're coming up on. And ultimately, this is only the beginning, and no one really knows where this is going to go yet. But all we know is that if this continues the way it is, it's either going to be really good or really bad, but it has the potential to be really good. Just imagine that for cybersecurity. So who controls the past, or who controls the past controls the future. He who controls the present controls the past. That's a 1984 quote, and it had to be done. So a bit of legacy VR. Does anybody remember this thing? The reason why this sucked is because they skimped on the hardware and they were shining lasers into people's eyes. <laughs> yes, how could that possibly go wrong? Uh, virtual reality was a mess. Ultimately, the hardware was not powerful enough back in the 90s when the last boom was. Even into the early 2000s, it was not powerful enough. We're only just now getting hardware powerful enough to truly power these things. And virtual reality ready laptops are literally only just now hitting the market. Up until now, there have been technology limitations such as NVIDIA Primus and graphics card power switching and not actually directly interfacing with the graphics card on HDMI, which have been causing issues up till now. Now they're finally starting to fix it on like, the laptops that have been released in the last month. Uh, historically, VR failed because it wasn't, the hardware wasn't powerful enough. Now it is, and the hardware is getting more powerful every day. Luckily, the current generation is a lot more powerful and doesn't have anywhere near as many issues. And with gesture controls, more powerful hardware, and more experience developing, it means it's going to be a truly amazing time to be in VR and AR. Ultimately, the big reason why displays, specifically for the Oculus and the Vive, have come into play the way they have is because they initially started using the mobile displays from phones in the headsets. So these headsets you're getting now for virtual reality are actually using phone displays. Uh, so technology leapfrogged with mobile and is now going into virtual reality based on mobile technologies. Um, ultimately, you've got the Vive ones, the Lighthouse base stations, and the Vive itself with the pass-through camera right there. And you've got the Oculus CV1 with the headset and the Oculus Touch controllers. And, you know, ultimately, the future's going to look bright. So, in the next five to ten years, Virtual reality and augmented reality are likely going to become the next user interface of choice for computing. Ultimately, these two technologies will likely merge into one headset and will ultimately likely be two modes of the same headset in the near future. They're guessing in certain circles it's likely to be two or three hardware generations out before this happens. So guess about three to four years, probably. Right now we have controllers and gesture. Right now we have controllers and gesture control is coming soon. And by gesture control, I mean gesture control without having something in your hand. Uh, we can already do stuff with gesture control with the wands, but soon it's going to be hand tracking based. Google recently filed a patent for actual hand tracking in 3D space from mobile VR. So it looks like they're going to be using Google Tango to track hands in VR headsets using Daydream within the next few hardware generations. Right now, the reason they don't do that is because the hardware is too big to be in the same system. Um, 10 to 20 years out, though, is where we really need to be worried, although we really need to be working on this now. The virtual reality and augmented reality systems of today and the code of today is going to be rolled into the interfaces in cybernetics and man machine interfaces later on. And this is what truly scares me, because having looked at this code for so long, I am truly terrified that someone will get root on my brain if I have cybernetics and it's using this code. I am truly terrified of that. And ultimately, privacy and malware is in the near future, and cybernetics is a decade or two away, but the cards are all falling into place as we speak. And ultimately, it may seem like it's science fiction, but historically, technology has shown. People reuse code all the time. And ultimately, Unity is currently the most common tool for virtual reality development. And 
because people like to reuse code. I have a really bad feeling about this. So those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Wise words from Winston Churchill. So historically, security has been an afterthought. Money, time, and ignorance have killed us so far. And if this continues, this might physically kill us, as in like <laughs> kind of dead. Uh, we have a chance to do it right this time now. And ultimately, we have to learn from the past. Historically, we've had bolt-on security measures, <coughs> HTTPS, <coughs> OTR, <coughs> things like that. Um, and historically, security hasn't been usable. But now with VR, this focused on usability more than anything else. Anything and everything we do has to be non-invasive. We cannot have little check boxes pop up saying, oh, update your antivirus or stuff like that. People aren't going to want that at all. And ultimately, usability is going to be bigger more than ever now. It has to be completely and totally transparent. Uh, and we have to decentralize, distribute, secure, and encrypt everything. Ultimately, if this technology starts going the way it looks like it's going to go, and I'm going to just jump into La La Land for a second. But if we start getting to the point where this starts going into cybernetics, do we really want our brains connected to the internet at all times? Hi, Google. Have fun drawing everything from my brain. Uh, virtual reality and augmented reality are next generation interfaces for military and medical tech, let alone everything else. So ultimately, we do have to pay attention to this. Right now, the Navy is actually experimenting with an augmented reality visor for divers in combat situations, where they can overlay things like instructions on how to defuse a bomb. So, hi, let's hack this and change it so you cut the blue wire or the red wire, and boom! So, what can we do now? Now's the time to demonstrate and fix these problems before they become widespread. Ultimately, time is ticking every second we talk. Time is ticking every second we sit around going, oh, let's just hunt O'Day and whatever. And security bugs in gaming and related code doesn't need to be fixed. Is any way we can get access to them, we need to fix it, and we need to start establishing a security and application security mindset in not just virtual reality and augmented reality communities, but game developer communities as well. Proper secure programming and design must be hammered into education, and it's not optional anymore, people. We can't just say, oh, it's an elective class. No, this has to be baseline programming classes. And we can't just say, oh, well, here's how you teach, here's how you code, now here's how you secure. No, it has to be all in the same class and all at the same time and teach how to do it properly from the start. Otherwise, this is going to end horribly. And we have to design the future to be distributed and decentralized and secure. We really do not want to centralize this stuff, and we are going to need new specifications and standards. And I have a history of working on that stuff. I've got some coming. So what must we not do? And this is important. The future is bright, but if we bring it down with doom and gloom, we're done. And it's going to end horribly. Ultimately, VR and AR has amazing potential. And when we're in the security echo chamber, we start going doom and gloom, doom and gloom. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to hear, oh, well, we need to be careful, otherwise we're going to get popped. Why do they care? Oh, we're going to terrify them? Well, that will either stifle innovation or make them ignore us completely as chicken littles. Uh, we must not alienate the game and virtual reality developer communities. I'm going to say this right now. The virtual reality community in particular is a lot more diverse than InfoSec is. And I hate bringing diversity into this because this is not that talk. But we must not be assholes the way we have been because ultimately, by being assholes, we shut people out. Uh, when we alienate people by acting like pricks, we kind of can't get our point across. And we must not push security at any cost because performance is king, and we will, uh, performance is king, and the king will not be dethroned. Ultimately, that 90 frames per second n number is not optional. It has to be at least that fast at all times. It cannot dip below that, or people will get physically sick. And then it's game over for that. So if we try that, welcome to Ignored Township, population, InfoSec. So ultimately, we're going to need a plan of action. 
The best option we have now is to reach out to game, augmented reality, and virtual reality developers, and those who teach them. Ultimately, we have a chance to fix this now and do it right from the start, or at least the start of virtual reality. And we can't do this alone. As much as we want to say, oh, look at me, I found O'Day, ultimately that O'Day is probably going to have several others like it. So just finding one O'Day is not going to help. But if we can get people to properly secure their code ahead of time, we can reduce O'Days overall. And then, you know, the O'Day might be more special and also we have less O-days to worry about, which could cause less harm. Always a good thing, unless you, you know, like to pimp vulnerabilities all day long. Maybe a bad thing. That may be a good thing because then it drives the price of O-days up on the market. Eh. Teach people how to securely program and a security mindset. This isn't just buffer overflows. This is, for example, teaching them that just because something does, just because SQL injection is a hot topic, and I have actually seen this personal Personally, I had a student from an unnamed school approach me with a project they worked on, and they wanted me to check it for SQL injection. They were sending the SQL statement from the client over the wire to the middle server, and then running that same SQL statement that they crafted on the client, as in the full SQL statement, on the back end. You don't need to inject that. Uh, all you really need to do is just say, hey, I'm going to send an SQL statement, and you're just going to execute it, whatever. Remote code execution, done. So ultimately, you know, just because you hear SQL injection is a hot topic does not mean you actually have to inject if someone does something like that. And unfortunately, this was apparently done out of laziness and because they didn't know any better. I wound up having to spend 30 minutes trying to explain this to them. And we have to root out bugs and mitigate them so they are harder to have happen again. And we have to create and enforce standards and specifications for not just secure but also ethical virtual reality, augmented reality, and game development. Because ultimately, we do not want someone going, oh, look at me, I'm going to be the cyber god and everyone using this is going to be forced to worship me or I will kill them in real life. Or, oh, I'm going to remove the logout button and if you die in game, you die in the real world. <coughs> Sword Art Online. <coughs> so, one final quote. The way technological re revolutions actually happen involves smart people working hard on the right problems at the right time. Look to your left, look to your right. Everyone in here is working on something. And ultimately, it may or may not be someone in this room, but we are on the forefront of fixing this. We're on the forefront of developing tools, technologies, security, everything. And if it's not us, it might not get done, period. Because we can't rely on someone else to take action. We can't rely on someone else to actually fix this because ultimately, someone else might not be thinking about the same things. Or they might be thinking about the same things, but they might think someone else will take care of it. Ultimately, we need to actually get our butts in gear in order to get this done. So. Any questions? Yeah. Haptics, yeah. Yeah, haptics. Tactile and haptics, um, that's currently being researched, but there isn't much beyond pressure controls and maybe a little bit of, I'm guessing, electronical stimulation to cause sensations. That's really a very emerging area of the technology, and that's only going to become more over time, but it's not there yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The sub pack? Yeah. That's already on Amazon. You can already buy those. And yeah, those are nice, but that doesn't cover things like wetness and stuff like that. It only covers impact. Uh, anyone else? Uh, yeah. Um, 
Um, the HoloLens in particular, they restrict you to a certain set of gestures. And the certain set of gestures are very much inspired by mobile. But the problem is that when you have a restricted set of gestures, you're not able to experiment with real natural based interfaces. The hardware is extremely weak on the HoloLens. And it's a limitation of the HoloLens itself. Ultimately, it's only got two gigabytes of RAM, which means you can't even run Unreal Engine on it. And it's extremely limited in using an Intel Atom processor. Its limitations are not just API, but also hardware. And the hardware is what makes it go from being potentially really useful, if they were to just fix those gesture controls, to being extremely limited. Ultimately, a lot of the things we're going to want to do in the virtual reality and augmented reality communities are going to require a lot more power than that. And the power itself is the problem. Is there anything on the that is better than that? Um, Tethered is going to be a lot more powerful. There's also the BT300, which is Android based, but I don't have the technical specs on that. AR? Augmented reality, yeah. Also, Oculus is working on a mid range solution, which is going to be VR without a tether, without a computer. So it looks like they're going to be possibly doing that Oculus as well on the VR front. Uh, they only just barely teased that at Oculus Connect a couple of days ago, though, so no one really has any details on that outside Facebook. Uh, hang on. Yeah? No, that's 90 frames per second in both eyes. So you're literally running 90 frames per second on two displays simultaneously. Yeah. Uh, yes, I have. And it's extremely underpowered. And frankly, the hardware is not up to snuff. It seems so when Play Sony announced the PlayStation Pro, they said that their intent was to try and compete with PC gaming in order to try and do 4K. But it doesn't actually do 4K. It just upscales. Um, the problem with PlayStation VR is that the hardware is not powerful enough and it's too low resolution and it looks very smeary. Um, the graphics themselves are actually nauseating. So that, I suspect, is going to do more harm than good. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. Um, kill it with fire? <laughs> I don't want that. Why do you think I have a five? <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. Uh, as far as security goes, how do you think that's actually going like, to manifest itself? Is this going to be like, something where the community is going to have to come up with like, a set of standards or something like that that everybody kind of agrees to? It's going to have to be that and further education on secure programming and application security. It's also going to require more tooling that we don't have yet, possibly stack analysis and other tools just to make sure things are secure, as well as getting people to stop being lazy, which we know will never happen. But, you know, unfortunately, people like to be lazy, and that causes a lot more issues than you would think. Yeah. Ultimately, we're going to have to drop some O-Days. <laughs> That's my suspicion. Ultimately, it might require a few DEF CON talks with a few O-Days in order to get them to wake up. That's my guess. And I mean O-Days as in like publicly revealing for the first time, not even responsibly disclosing O-Days. Things like that. We might need to do some irresponsible disclosure very publicly to get the message across. Anyone else? Uh, Bueller? Bueller, Bueller, thank you. <laughs>
Um, the HoloLens in particular, they restrict you to a certain set of gestures. And the certain set of gestures are very much inspired by mobile. But the problem is that when you have a restricted set of gestures, you're not able to experiment with real natural based interfaces. The hardware is extremely weak on the HoloLens. And it's a limitation of the HoloLens itself. Ultimately, it's only got two gigabytes of RAM, which means you can't even run Unreal Engine on it. And it's extremely limited in using an Intel Atom processor. Its limitations are not just API, but also hardware. And the hardware is what makes it go from being potentially really useful, if they were to just fix those gesture controls, to being extremely limited. Ultimately, a lot of the things we're going to want to do in the virtual reality and augmented reality communities are going to require a lot more power than that. And the power itself is the problem. Is there anything on the horizon that is better than that? Um, tethered is going to be a lot more powerful. There's also the BT300, which is Android based, but I don't have the technical specs on that. AR? Augmented reality, yeah. Also, Oculus is working on a mid range solution, which is going to be VR without a tether, without a computer. So it looks like they're going to be possibly doing that Oculus as well in the VR front. Uh, they only just barely teased that at Oculus Connect a couple of days ago though, so no one really has any details on that outside Facebook. Uh, hang on. Yeah? No, that's 90 frames per second in both eyes. So you're literally running 90 frames per second on two displays simultaneously. Yeah. Uh, yes, I have. And it's extremely underpowered. And frankly, the hardware is not up to snuff. It seems, so when Play, Sony announced the PlayStation Pro, they said that their intent was to try and compete with PC gaming in order to try and do 4K. But it doesn't actually do 4K. It just upscales. Um, the problem with PlayStation VR is that the hardware is not powerful enough and it's too low resolution and it looks very smeary. Um, the graphics themselves are actually nauseating. So that, I suspect, is going to do more harm than good. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. Um, kill it with fire? <laughs> I don't want that. Why do you think I have a Vive? <laughs> Anyone? Yeah. Uh, as far as security goes, how do you think that's actually going like, to manifest itself? Is this going to be like, something where the community is going to have to come up with like, a set of standards or something like that that everybody kind of agrees to? It's going to have to be that and further education on secure programming and application security. It's also going to require more tooling that we don't have yet, possibly static analysis and other tools just to make sure things are secure, as well as getting people to stop being lazy, which we know will never happen. But you know, unfortunately, people like to be lazy, and that causes a lot more issues than you would think. Yeah. Ultimately, we're going to have to drop some O-days. <laughs> That's my suspicion. Ultimately, it might require a few DEF CON talks with a few O-days in order to get them to wake up. That's my guess. And I mean O-days as in like publicly revealing for the first time, not even responsibly disclosing O-days. Things like that. We might need to do some irresponsible disclosure very publicly to get the message across. Anyone else? Uh, Bueller? Bueller, Bueller, thank you. <laughs>